So welcome to the Preprint to Publications webinar series. My name is Martin Esterman, and I'm a Prelights ambassador and organizer of this webinar series. So if you haven't heard of us, Prelights is a preprint highlight service run by the company of biologists and supporting um, by the biological community. So Prelights aims to summarize preprints to promote quickly dissemination of scientific findings and encourage discussion within the research community before the formal peer review. So for this uh, webinar presentation, I have the pleasure to introduce the, today to the Statman investigator, Laura Kirosuo from the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, NIH uh, in, in the United States. Her lab focuses on understanding the molecular mechanisms behind the maintenance of neural crest stemness, how fates are, choices are made, and whether normal development processes apply to neural crest derived birth defects and cancer. So today she will be talking about um, the publishing journey from the preprint available in BioArchive in January 2023 till the final publication in September 2023 of uh, this year in Nature Communications. Um, Laura's preprint was highlighted in January 2023 by the pre-lighter Andrew Montequin, who is also accompanying me in this uh, webinar. With nothing else to add, I really welcome Laura to take control of the stage and delight us with your presentation. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, and it's a, a true pleasure to be here today. So as Martin uh, um, mentioned, uh, the, the work that I'm going to be talking about is how we uh, came to the final version, uh, published version of uh, the paper maintenance of pluripotency-like signature in the entire ectoderm leads to neural crest stem cell potential, and which was uh, highlighted, uh, the preprint was highlighted in the pre-lights. Okay, so we in my lab uh, study, oh, the not that advancing. There we go. Uh, in my lab, we study the neural crest, uh, which is a transient stem cell population that forms during early development in all vertebrate embryos. And it's uh, worth noticing that early means really early. So in us humans, the neural crest starts to form during the second week of gestation. And this is before any of the organs have started to form. And the, the neural crest starts to form at the same time from the ectodermal germ layer as the central nervous system. So here we are now looking at a cartoon of the ectodermal germ layer uh, during the neurulation process. And uh, du during this uh, neurulation process, the ectoderm gets patterned into three distinct domains. So in the middle, there is the neural plate, which uh, eventually forms a tube, which is the neural tube. And this will give rise to the central nervous system, which is the brain in the head and the spinal cord in the rest of the body. And then the very lateral parts are, is called the non-neural ectoderm. And that eventually wraps around the entire body and that will be the skin. So in between, we have this green region, which is called the neural plate border region. And that uh, then uh, is where the neural crest forms. And uh, by the times the neural, neural folds rise, the neural crest is being uh, first induced here and then speci uh, gradually specified. And by the time the neural tube has closed, the neural crest cells are fully specified uh, into, uh, and they are ready to go through an epithelial to mesenchymal transition process so that they actually detach from the epithelial layer and then migrate towards uh, various destinations in the body to give rise to many different cell types. So um, it's important to note that just like the whole embryo, the neural crest also forms in an anterior to posterior manner. So meaning that the head neural crest forms first. So uh, by the time in the head, the neural crest already is migrating to where, towards its destinations. In the trunk, the neural crest is only starting to be specified at the neural plate border. And the various, uh, the, the list of genes that uh, are derived from the neural crest is very impressive. So the, it's uh, particularly uh, important for the craniofacial skeleton formation. So it gives rise to uh, the bone and cartilage in the face, as well as dentine of the teeth, but also as well as many other mesenchymal type cells, which would be the pericytes uh, and meninges of the forebrain, also uh, parts of the, the cornea, but then also the mesenchymal counterparts of several um, uh, 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 organs in the in the head and neck regions, such, such as the thyroid, uh, salivary glands, parathyroid, and thymus. And then it also gives rise to adipocytes in the face and neck and, uh, um, and uh, 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 smooth muscle cells. 
um, and other parts of the of the other structures of the heart as well. Then the neural crest gives rise to almost the entire peripheral nervous system. So uh, with exception of some co contribution in the head from the cranial placodes, all uh, peripheral nerves are neural crest derived. And uh, this also includes the enteric nervous system. And then all the pigmentation of our skin is neural crest derived, as well as then uh, several types of endocrine cells, for example, uh, the chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla. Okay, so if we now look at this impressive list of the neural crest derivatives, it's not that surprising that things don't always go right during development. And uh, uh, there are several diseases uh, caused by uh, 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 neural crest defects. And as a group, these are referred to as neurocrestopathies. So roughly 20% uh, or a quarter of all birth defects uh, are neur neurocrestopathies. And they include, a uh, big part of them uh, include craniofacial malformations such as cleft palate or cleft lip, lip. But we also know several syndromes that are neurocrystopathies such as DeGeorge, uh, Charge or Treacher Collins, so or the Hirschsprung's disease, which is a, a ganglionosis of, of the colon. And then also several uh, cancers are known to be neural crest derived, including uh, melanoma and the childhood uh, cancer pediatric tumors neuroblastoma. Okay, so now if we take a look uh, of this list uh, of these different neural crest derived syndromes, we, are, we can appreciate that all the, all the diseases that I have highlighted in red uh, have defects in multiple tissues that have contribution from the neural crest. So this suggests that whatever went wrong during the development of these uh, individuals with this, 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 these diseases happened when the neural crest cells were still at the stem cell stage and had not uh, 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 chose their future, uh, future fate. Uh, whereas in comparison, for example, the Hirschsprung's disease only in, uh, uh, manifests in the in the gut and is an uh, 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 is uh, as, as a lack of lack of neurons. So this suggests that the the uh, timing of the neural uh, when the neural crest defect occurs happened or when the neural crest cells already have reached into the gut. So the more we want to understand, uh, the more we understand about the stem cell capacity of the neural crest cells early when they still haven't chosen their future lineages the more it will help us to understand the etiologies behind these uh, many of these different syndromes. So this brings us to, to the project that I'm going to be sharing with you today, which was made by a graduate student, Jaren Payanoja, who, who's um, I am except, like uh, enormously grateful of having Jaren. She is very talented and, and she's just about to graduate. So she asked, how does the neural crest obtain this exceptionally high stem cell potential to be able to make all these different kinds of derivatives? So in order to understand Jaren's work, we first need to go all the way back to uh, what gastrulation is. So that's the formation of the three germ layers. And uh, in, so what it means is that uh, in gastru before gastrulation, the epiblast cells are pluripotent, meaning that all of these cells in the epiblast layer uh, are which will become the embryo are able to make all the cell types of the embryo but now this pluripotency is thought to be permanently lost when the neural uh, when the epiblast cells in ingress through the primitive streak and now the three germ layers are formed so after gastrulation uh, all the cell types, uh, all the cells in the different germ layers still are multipotent, meaning that they can give rise to various different or tens of different cell types, but they are always restricted within the uh, origin of the germ layer. And the neural crest comes from, so they are multipotent, and the neural crest comes from the ectodermal germ layer. But now, just remembering what I just showed you about gastrulation, now if we take a new look at the diverse group of neural crest derived cells, you can appreciate that only pigment cells and neurons and glia look like typical ectodermally derived cells. Whereas the, the other cell types that we know that equally come, came from the ectoderm and are neural crest derived look like they actually should have been formed from the mesoderm or the endoderm if, if um, if the rules of gastrulation would apply. So this makes us conclude that the neural crest doesn't obey the rules of gastrulation. 
And uh, this is the dilemma that we wanted to understand. How is it possible? So how is the exceptionally high stemness gained in the neural crest is what uh, Jaren uh, asked. And uh, now, uh, this is, we are not the first ones to ask, ask this question or answer it. it it's been a, a conundrum in the neural quest field for quite some time. So uh, uh, just to give you some background, uh, the for, this was first addressed already almost 10 years ago in, by Carol Labon's lab, where they came up uh, with some in situ, uh, whole mount in situ hybridization based study in frog embryos they came uh, to the conclusion that the, the uh, uh, pluripotency or the pluripotency like stem cell capacity of the neural crest is maintained all the way from pre stage by the ability of the neural crest genes to be already marking kind of a pro-neural crest domain in the blastocysts. And then uh, the expression of the, of the neural crest genes would then protect uh, the neural crest uh, from um, differentiation in uh, regularly as, uh, where the other, whereas the other ectodermal uh, domains uh, go through gastrulation normally. And then uh, this was opposed now uh, two years ago by a completely different model where they in mouse uh, in a mouse study the authors find this is um, um, Joanna Visochka's uh, lab so they came up with a reactivation model instead so here they suggested that no the gastro the epiblast has normally gastrulated into the three germ layers whereas then the neural crest domain in the already gastrulated ectoderm has a unique ability to regain and reactivate the ex expression of the pluripotency genes and uh, thus then obtain the uh, exceptionally high stem cell potential. So uh, at this point, I think in order to keep you interested in what I'm gonna show you, uh, I want to mention that our results do not agree with either of these models, so stay tuned. And uh, we thus wanted to understand like uh, uh, um, uh, what happens in the ectoderm, can we find support to either of these models? So the question is how is neural crest stemness formed and maintained uh, in the ectoderm? And in our study, we now use the chicken ectoderm as our, um, uh, as our approach. So uh, we, want, we performed a thorough follow-up of trans transcriptional changes of stemness from all the way from gastrula to the end of neurulation. So here again, we see the cartoons of the stages that we, we analyzed and uh, uh, the uh, key was that we wanted to understand how the neural crest domain, uh, shown here in red, develops as part of the ectodermal patterning process, and also how does the neural crest during its, its development gain uh, uh, the exceptionally high stem cell potential. So for this, we used three different techniques. So the first two uh, we applied for these four stages shown here, and uh, for that we applied uh, the, a spatial single cell uh, multiplex spatial transcriptomics technique that I will tell you details about shortly. And then we also uh, used single cell RNA sequencing for these exact same stages where we uh, analyzed the entire, uh, entire ectoderm. And then in order to not miss any even subtle changes in the transcriptional profile, then we also um, collected samples from just the red region, just the, the neural plate border and the neural crest. Uh, uh, from 12 consecutive uh, samples, which were collected in developmental time only one hour apart from each other. Okay, so the single cell multiplex spatial transcriptomics or single cell MST approach uh, links transcriptionally distinct subpopulations with spatial coordinates in vivo. And it's basically just an adaptation of multiplex single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization. So the, the main uh, point is, that uh, we basically have five channels in our microscope, so we can hybridize uh, five different transcripts or, or genes of uh, or transcripts of five different genes simultaneously, and then we just take pictures of each individual channel to see the individual expression of each each gene. And now these uh, uh, and they are amplified by using the HER technique. So now the HER probes uh, are made. Uh, from DNA. So now if we use DNA, we can wipe out the entire signal and then we can just do a rehybridization round by applying uh, probes for five new genes and so forth. 
So by, uh, in this study, we repeated this now uh, uh, for six times. So we uh, applied, uh, we were analyzing the expression of 30 genes in the, in the ectoderm. So uh, the most significant step of our method as compared to all the other um, uh, spatial transcriptomic techniques that are available currently is based on uh, our um, machine learning algorithm based image analysis we, where we actually uh, anal uh, we can actually identify the uh, single cells in 3D. So if you look at this picture, you can see that all these uh, white dots are individual RNA transcripts and they are diffraction lim limited. So we can, by using uh, uh, high resolution um, uh, uh, confocal imaging, we can we can count the dots, but there is no way we can actually estimate which dots belong to what cell. So to overcome this, we added a cell segmentation step, which is based on strong immunolabeling of the cells and the cell membranes. So as you can see, we can nicely trace the, the cell membranes in 3D. And this now gives us a nice recapitulation of the uh, individual cells um, and their borders. So now uh, by doing this, we can act actually then just count the RNA transcripts within each individual cell. And then we pull all the data together uh, into a single heat map. But before we, I show you the heat map, let, um, let me show you the list of genes that we chose for, for this particular study. So again, we wanted to understand how the neural crest forms as part of the ectodermal patterning process and also how the stemness forms in the neural crest. So for this, we chose known genes that mark the neural crest region or the neural plate border and the, later the neural crest, and then uh, known genes for the future epidermis and known genes for the future central nervous system. And in, a, uh, in addition to that, we chose these known uh, pluripotency markers, nano, OX4, KLF4, uh, uh, and LIN28A. Okay, so let me first show you how the end of new relation, the end point of our study looks like. Uh, so here we, oops, that was too early. So here now we have a, a, a heat map where we have pulled all the cells from this last end of new relation stage together. So in general, we get, um, uh, so for all stages, we analyzed at least information from at least four embryos per stage. And this gave us, depending on the stage, uh, cell 5,000 to 8,000 cells. And all these cells are now um, pulled into this heat map. And now what you can see here is that all uh, that at this stage, we can clearly see that we have some committed cells. So uh, like here, the, we have cells that are our future neural cells and future uh, epidermal cells, and they do not express anything else based on the heat map. So they are committed to their future fates. And now the best part of this study is that we can actually now um, uh, uh, map the, the location of these cells back into the original embryos by pseudo coloring them. So now, as you can see, we have uh, we have these committed uh, cell populations here uh, in the cor exactly correct places as uh, according to the cartoon I showed you earlier. So here we have the future skin, here we have uh, neural crest, and these are neural crest cells that are not stem cells, they only express neural crest markers, and then we also have uh, neural cells in, in the correct places in the in the neural tube. But now uh, we also identified that there are some stem cells in the um, in this um, at this stage. So um, if you look at this heat map, you can see that actually these orange cells are also neural crest cells. They have high expression of the neural crest markers, but they virtually express everything that we tested for, uh, as well as they co-express all the pluripotency genes. So then, then when we look where these cells are, they are actually intermingling the, uh, they are, we could name them neural crest stem cells, and they are intermingling with the neural crest cells that are not stem cells. And this we named uh, uh, as a temporary neural crest stem cell niche in the dorsal neural tube. And interestingly, at, uh, and this was the very, we actually, this uh, finding is not new to this work. Uh, we uh, showed that already earlier uh, in the paper where we originally um, developed the, the single cell MST technique, which we just further optimized to do several stages uh, and uh, uh, several um, fields of fuse uh, per, per sample for, for this more um, advanced version that we used in this work. But anyway, so uh, the, when we originally published the um, 
the the result that the, the, we have this subpopulation of neural crest stem cells that co-express the pluripotency genes. That was the very first time to show that the neural crest cells actually express these true pluripotency markers like nanog nano and OX4, that they co-express them, which um, which uh, was the first step to explain uh, that to start to explain how the neural crest actually can be so uh, highly um, uh, pluripotent like. But that that study we didn't know how the um, niche develops. How did it get there? So that's the focus of of this current study. But before I go show you that still wanted to show you that there is also uh, we also have identified that there is another stem cell niche in the dorsal neural tube so if you look at their transcriptional profile they also co-express the pluripotency genes but they otherwise have a very neural profile so these are cns neural stem cells which we didn't know before either that would be uh, located in the dorsal neural tube okay but uh, now in order to understand how this niche the neural crest stem cell niche uh, develops we i will now show you the the stage where the uh, neural folds are uh, are starting to to fold so here again we have a, a very busy heat map uh, but uh, as you can see uh, we have commit like just like in the cartoon i showed you we already do have committed groups for the uh, future epidermis and the future neural. And as you can see in this zoom in, these committed groups spatially don't overlap with each other either. But this is not the whole truth, but uh, instead, uh, in addition to these committed groups, we have a lot of stem cells, which we divided into two different parts. So the first ones here, we uh, uh, we named transitioning stem cells. So if you look at the expression profile of these cells, we can see, see that the red cells are going to be uh, neural crest cells because of the high expression of the neural bed border markers, and the green cells are going to, going to be epidermis. But they also co-express a lot of the other markers, so it's uh, so they still co-express the pluripotency genes, and they also uh, co-express co genes from the neighboring domain. So we uh, take it as sign of uh, gradually committing towards. Uh, uh, their fate. And if we look at the spatial um, location of these transitioning groups, you can appreciate that while the domains are kind of correct already, they are also spatially overlapping with each other. But the most important finding is again these orange cells. So here, based on this transcriptional profile, uh, they are stem cell. They are they ex co-express the pluripotency genes, and clearly these cells. Uh, you you cannot guess based on this heat map which ectodermal cells these guys are going to be. So those uh, have uh, were the undecided uh, neural uh, undecided stem cells. And we were super uh, uh, surprised and uh, excited to see that they don't just reside in the neural crest domain, which uh, we anticipated uh, that uh, would be the case, because we know that the neural crest has this uh, plural, uh, exceptional high, uh, exceptionally high pluripotency-like um, function or like capacity, but instead they reside. Uh, we can see them overlapping the whole ectoderm. So this was very exciting. And uh, from this, we can conclude that the developing ectoderm has a much higher plasticity than what we have previously understood. And also that the ectodermal patterning doesn't occur abruptly right after gastrulation, but it's instead a much more gradual process. But since we were mostly interested in, in the broad, uh, in the stemness capacity in the ectoderm, so next we asked that how broad is the stemness in the entire ectoderm? And in order to answer that question, we uh, uh, took advantage of z-scoring. So next, we, we selected all the cells that co-express the uh, different pluripotency genes uh, above mean levels. And uh, uh, it's important to mention that the co-expression is the we see as the key sign for, for the pluripotency-like signature, uh, since we do know that some uh, uh, POV especially has been reported to be expressed alone without the other pluripotency genes and it drives and, and that they don't, those cells are not pluripotent. So POV alone uh, doesn't reflect um, uh, pluripotency like stemness, but the, we, uh, from based on our study, we think that the co-expression of all three can be taken uh, as this sign. Okay, so now we wanted to visualize these uh, cells that co-express the pluripotency genes. And as you can see, we they nicely span the whole ectoderm uh, after gastrulation. And this doesn't end. 
So here we see them spanning the entire ectoderm, all the three different domains uh, until the late neural fold stage. And only at the end of neurulation, the, the, the uh, cells with the pluripotency signature are restricted to the dorsal neural tube. And uh, this is particularly, uh, th this is a feature of the ectoderm. We do not see the cells with the uh, pluripotency signature in the mesoderm or the endoderm. And then, um, uh, so from this, we can already conclude that there is a continuation of ectoderma pluripotency all the way from gastrula stage. So uh, we do not see any signs of reactivation, if you remember what the, what the um, uh, uh, model number two was. So we, these results don't agree with that. Uh, and then we also used the bulk RNA sequencing uh, to, to follow up on the pluripotency. So then here now, remember, we collected the uh, RNA seq sam samples uh, just from the neural crest domains. And as you can see, we do see continuous expression in these samples that were collected just one hour apart uh, uh, throughout the whole neurulation process, supporting the continuation. And also we checked uh, the expression of several other gene, pluripotency genes that are uh, 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 a part of the pluripotency network in the, uh, in the epiblast. So with this, uh, we were happy to see the continuation of the pluripotency signature, but we were kind of wondering that why, why is the ectoderm so pluripotent? What's the purpose of that? So uh, the thing that came to mind that probably because they are ex at, the, at the same time when the pluripotency is, um, uh, is maintained, the ectoderm actually gets patterned. So perhaps they are some sort of pan ectodermal stem cells that are needed for the gradual ectodermal patterning process so that they are cells that are still undecided between the different fates. Uh, and to test this, we now then next visualized all the cells with the pluripotency signature, but also co-express the two opposing fates in the in the ectoderm, uh, SOX2, which is a, a central nervous system a CNS neural marker, and AP2 alpha, which marks the the epidermis. So, indeed, if we now look where these uh, pan ectodermal stem cells. Uh, uh, are. So it looks very similar to what we see in the early neural folds. Uh, so, so it looks like the majority of the, and we also counted this, so roughly 90% of the these cells also uh, uh, ha have a uh, pan-ectodermal profile. So then uh, in, uh, why the most of the pluripotent cells uh, reside with the neural crest domain. It's important to note that some of them also actually reside with the neural stem cell population. And here we think that the neural stem cells are uh, required for the next step in development in particular, because now soon the neural crest cells will emigrate away from the dorsal neural tube and which leaves behind a, a kind of like a, a bad mess. So then uh, we think that the neural stem cells are uh, required to rebuild the dorsal neural tube and which eventually then becomes the, the roof plate. And we actually um, hypothesize that uh, because we know that the roof plate further on then gives rise to, to the, the radial glial cells in the ependuma and the radial glial cells are the, the central nervous system brain stem cells. So it might be that the, the stemness from the radial glial cells actually Actually is also derived all the way from the pre-gastrula stage. But this we didn't, this is how we are just speculating, we did not uh, uh, do any studies to, co to confirm it. So based on this, the entire developing ectoderm contains undecided panectodermal stem cells. So then uh, the third method that we used was the single cell RNA sequencing, which we uh, collected also from the exact same stages that we used the single cell uh, multiplex spatial transcriptomics for. And now we basically wanted to uh, verify our results to get a, a stronger consensus that there is actually maintenance of the pluripotency like signature. So for that, uh, we this is what the new map looks like from the, all the stages. And then because we were interested in the ectodermal pluripotency, we now subsetted the ectoderm. And from now on, the new map will look like this. So it, it now um, clustered according to the different developmental stages. So this is the earliest stage after gastrulation. This is a mixture of the two middle stages, and this is a mixture of the last two stages. Okay, 
so the first thing we did uh, to, to confirm that there is continuation of the pluripotency-like signature, we performed uh, RNA velocity, uh, to, which, uh, uh, which determines the ratio between unspliced and spliced uh, variants. So as long as the, the uh, transcripts are majorly unspliced, that can be taken as a sign of active transcription, and then the velocity is green in this map. So as our control gene, AP2-alpha, uh, we actually can see that there is active transcription uh, uh, throughout the first uh, first three stages, but at the end of neurulation, the transcription the transcripts are majorly uh, spliced, uh, and uh, uh, the transcription is uh, downregulating. So, uh, but now if we look at the pluripotency genes, we see that the velocity is green throughout all the developmental stages. Uh, confirming uh, our con uh, the active process uh, active production of these pluripotency genes in the ectoderm at all these different stages. So ne next, we then used module scoring to to find those pan ectodermal stem cells from this data set. So what we did is we used um, uh, made a module for the same uh, genes that we used for the pan ectodermal status in the uh, spatial transcriptomics data that I just showed you. And we were happy to see that the cells with the high red score for the pan ectodermal signature were found at all different stages uh, that from the gastrula to the end of neurulation. But here, as we have no spatial context, so we next then wanted to understand that are uh, these also then neural crest cells. So then we made a uh, we made um, another uh, profile uh, score for specified neural crest as and as you can see here um, the specified neural crest genes only come on at the end of neurulation uh, uh, and we can see that now at the end of neurulation they uh, 70% 76% of the uh, neural crest cells also share the pan ectodermal status and this is also a nice picture to kind of um, go back to the uh, other the first hypothesis that was suggesting that the uh, maintenance of the pluripotency like signature in the neural crest is due to the expression of these neural crest markers so as you can see we do, our results don't agree with that either uh, because uh, even though we think that the uh, the uh, stem cell potential is maintained in the ectoderm it is not due to the expression of the neural crest genes because they only come up at the late, uh, at the end of neurulation Whereas we think that the reason for the pluripotency maintenance is the expression of the actual pluri pluripotency genes in the entire ectoderm. Okay, and then finally, if you remember, we also saw some contribution uh, of the panectodermal stem cells in the neural population. So uh, we checked that too by using a, a, neur a neural module. And then again, we can see that 30% of the neural cells also uh, share uh, pan ectodermal stem cell status. So this was very nice and uh, in line with what we saw with the single cell MST. And here, just because we can, uh, I'm showing you further analysis from the single cell um, uh, data. So we were also able to take a deeper look into what the pan ectodermal stem cells express as compared to the cells that we marked others. So, uh, so you can see that uh, the higher expression of the uh, non-neural ectodermal genes and the neural plate border genes resides with the pan ecto status, whereas the they, the pan ecto cells uh, express equal levels of neural stem cell genes in in the pan ecto and the the other cells in the samples, whereas then the more advanced neural progenitor genes were expressed more in the other population. Okay, so next we then wanted to understand uh, that how is the the uh, that a little bit more that what do the pluripotency genes do in the in in the ectoderm and in the in particularly in the neural crest domain? So we used mofrolino knockdowns individually for all these three pluripotency genes, and then we uh, collected the cells. Uh, so we uh, knocked down at gastrula stage, and then uh, we collected the samples at the uh, late neural fold stages. And as you can see, we found 89 genes that were mutually affected by the knockdown of all three uh, pluripotency genes. And then we used this over-representation uh, molecular function groups to, to understand what kind of uh, cellular processes were mostly affected by the knockdowns. 
or that which were shared. So here we found uh, 27 molecular functions that uh, um, that were either sh uh, similarly shared by all three of the knockdowns, or at least uh, or at least two of them. So now, if we so what I mean by this is that if we look at, for example, this um, function here. Um, uh, consists of mitotic cell cycle. So you can see that compared to the control morpholinocyte, uh, th there is a knockdown of all these genes uh, in all three of the knockdowns. So most, so the molecular functions that were shared uh, were had to do with cell cycle regulation and DNA damage repair. So importantly, uh, from this, we could conclude that all these, uh, the pluripotency genes impact general stemness functions. And what we were, what I mean by this is that we, we were kind of looking if we could see some some uh, reflections of fate choices so that if we knock down nanog do we see already uh, uh, like a, a inability of to form mesenchymal cell types of the neural crest or so forth but we didn't see any of that so we think that that the pluripotency genes maintain just general stemness functions and this then uh, uh, brings up a relevant question. Uh, so um, that is the stemness required for all neural crests to form from head to toe? Because remember, I showed you in the beginning that uh, different uh, axial levels in the body give rise to different neural crest derivatives. So, and the, interestingly, only the head and neck region gives rise to these um, mesenchymal cell types and the, and the bone and the cartilage. So it has been then, um, uh, now uh, speculated in the literature uh, that the the stem, the expression of these pluripotency genes is particular is required for these mesenchymal cell types to form. But now, according to our results, uh, we see the plur uh, we wanted to now the the functions that are not uh, that are affected do not uh, show any signs of mesenchymal cell types. So that made us uh, uh, wonder whether it's actually a general requirement. Uh, for just neural crest to form. So to answer that, we now looked at, uh, we used fluorescent in situ hybridization to look at expression of neural crest um, in uh, the expression of the pluripotency genes in the neural crest in the trunk. So now at this stage of the trunk, now the the these uh, these cells are at the pre-migratory stage, the same stage that is the end of, uh, 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 starts to be the end of neurulation, uh, as you can see by SOX, 10, which is the marker that comes on only in the pre-migratory cells. And now you can see that the pluripotency genes are nicely expressed throughout the trunk and the, the neural plate border. So uh, this suggests that, uh, it, that the pluripotency gene expression is not linked to a mesoderma-like potential in the head, but instead it's a general requirement. And as you can see here in the cross sections, we see overexpression of the, um, we see expression of the all the three pluripotency genes in the SOX10 uh, neural crest domain. But interestingly, whereas NANOG uh, uh, resides mostly in the neural crest cells, the both uh, or OX4 actually has a very lot broad expression pattern and it's uh, expressed alone in the neural, uh, in the entire neural tube. Okay, so then finally, uh, we also wanted to get some ideas that if this is a, a general requirement for, uh, if this is a conserved mechanism for neural crest to form uh, across vertebrates, and we also then tested uh, uh, did some in situ in mouse embryos to see uh, mammalian expression to just to see if we can uh, uh, if we can um, recapitulate the main finding of our work that the entire ectoderm and not just the neural crest domain expresses uh, co-expresses these pluripotency genes, and as you can see, that is the case. So there is nanog and KLF4 and both in the entire ectoderm and not just the neural crest domain. Okay, so with these results, uh, I want to conclude what I've, I showed you. So we find that the in, instead of the ectoderm being strictly patterned right after gastrulation to these uh, different distinct domains of the future uh, fates, there is actually a lot of, uh, there are several stem cell uh, populations that are still uh, transitioning between the groups and most Importantly, we find a large population of undecided stem cells that are, that overlap all the different domains, the entire ectoderm, very late uh, in uh, after gastrulation in during the neurulation process. So, with this, uh, we can conclude that um, uh, we think that uh, after gastrulation, the ectoderm actually does not. 
uh, lose its pluripotency like signature. So it continues to express the, the pluripotency genes and then it gradually loses it so that the CNS domains and the epidermis uh, lose it a little bit earlier, whereas then the neural crest domain is able to maintain uh, the, the pluripotency like stemness, which we also think that then uh, uh, gives rise to the new dorsal neural stem cells, which, which we hypothesize might have uh, a direct contribution to the ependymal radial uh, glial cells, the neural stem cells in the brain. So here now, uh, I'm repeating myself. We think that the entire uh, we we find that the entire ectoderm maintains cells with a pluripotency signature long after gastrulation has ended, and we suggest that this mechanism by which the neural crest gains its exceptionally high uh, stem cell potential that this is the very mechanism how the neural crest gains its exceptionally high stem cell potential. And then uh, we also uh, think that the ectodermal pluripotency is necessary for a much more gradual ectodermal patterning process, process uh, to take place than what we previously knew. And it happens uh, in all axial levels. And it's also a, a relevant, uh, it's also the case for mammals. And then we hypothesize that the stemness uh, might, uh, is required for the reconstruction of the dorsal neural tube and the formation of the radial glial stem cells. And then also uh, with all this, our cha results challenge how we understand gastrulation because now we, for, for the first time, show that uh, the ectoderm doesn't, one of the germ layers actually doesn't lose the stemness during uh, gastrulation. Okay, so th this is the our lab right now. And I especially want to thank Jaren who did most of the work, but she, uh, and, and she was helped with uh, Jenny and uh, Sean, and then also all these uh, former uh, lab members. So happy to take questions, but I think now I will continue then, or do we want to um, have the discussion or shall I, I think I'll just show now a little bit of the process. How much time do I have? A little bit. Yeah, so the, the uh, it's really hard to say what affects what, but uh, the process went so that when we, we um, we put the uh, we submitted the paper to nature communications and as it went and as in the submission process we actually they asked that uh, do you do, would you like us to to put it in research square to, to where we put all the manuscripts that are um, uh, are under consideration for uh, for publication and then we checked that box so actually then that became the preprint be, uh, and so uh, because then the for, when we knew that it was in re, uh, it was under review we want we had already made a preprint for the bioarchive which where you can edit and edit the work and it looks more like a paper and but then when we uh, submitted it to bioarchive they said no you can't submit it because you have, it's already online uh, in the research square so don't if you want particularly to uh, publish your preprint in bioarchive don't say yes to any of these uh, journal preprints but anyway so for the uh, when the preprint was then there in research where we uh, uh, tweeted it and we uh, so i have at the time i had maybe like 350 followers so we got 7 uh, 7 7.5 thousand um, views 66 six likes and 24 retweets and then uh, then andrew uh, uh, highlighted the the pre-light uh, soon after, and it uh, I, I, it's hard for me to say it didn't get much attention in my uh, feed. Uh, oops, oops, uh, but um, but also I didn't do the original post. So, but I am sure that any any repetition of the same work is good. So, any publicity, the more you repeat it, the better. Uh, but during this this um, preprint. Pre uh, phase I think uh, I was counting that I got roughly got like uh, 40 more followers which is okay because uh, extend so because I don't have that many followers to begin with and then when we finally published the work in nature communications uh, like uh, five months later uh, we got the most views so we got 23,000 views 172 likes and 51 retweets and it was also it got a lot of publicity uh, like we were happy with the publicity so it was uh, published in nine different outlets and it also reached like the 98th uh, percentile of all the uh, journals published uh, uh, with the same time uh, and uh, like according to the age so it it was it succeeded well in the in the stats 
So, and maybe the preprint already helped. So at least like we were happy. Uh, so, and also we, uh, Nature Review's genetics uh, review uh, also um, referenced our preprint. So it was definitely worth having it so that it could be referenced. And I did get a lot of comments on the preprint already from, from colleagues. Okay. And then just to show, tell a little bit about the, the process. So uh, we, uh, the, uh, so the, we, it, our preprint was pretty ready when we submitted it. So it didn't change too much, but the reviewer, uh, reviewer, uh, reviewer suggested um, uh, some quite nice, they had nice suggestions so that we could still mostly like also clarify the text. So one of the things was that we additionally called these, uh, the cells with the pluripotency signature we called them pluripotent, which I completely agree with. That uh, was a little bit hasty. So they commented that they we don't have any functional data. So we kind of made that clarification more clear in the in the text that we are we are basing our hypothesis on transcriptional uh, only transcriptional data. So we don't have much um, function uh, functional data to say what the role of these actually these genes actually is. And then during the time, uh, we, I was also presenting the work, so maybe not so much uh, the re due to the reviewers, but just the the work was kind of like matured in our heads. So we changed, we kind of like, like improved the the final cartoon from the old one to the new one. And then also the reviewers asked a lot of questions of like um, the in um, first of all like we uh, to. To, to see that the, is the pluripotency overall decreased? Like, can we quantify that? So, so we then use these UMAPs to show that the pluripotency overall decreases uh, and uh, during the development uh, tal time or the, during neurulation. And also we could then, by using this other, uh, the, this distinct algorithm show that the, the neural crest, uh, how the neural crest cells are, um, uh, expressed and where they are and also how the pluripotency genes we still only only 2.2 because there are so many so many more cells at the end of neurulation in general and the 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 proportion is just a subpopulation of neural crest cells so, so we could show that only at the in the from the whole embryo only two percent of the uh, cells are pluripotent at that point, uh, whereas it's 44% um, in the uh, in the uh, right after gastrulation. And then we also, from the bulk RNA sequencing uh, data, we added a, a, a um, heat map to visualize the transition uh, from like that, the uh, whereas the neural crest genes uh, come up, this is all the upregulated genes and all the neural crest cells uh, genes are there included. Then there's a down regulation of the pluripotency genes and the overlapping stages are now nicely visualized here. So that this is the time when they are co starting to be co-expressed. Okay, and then we just added a little bit of new supplementary data. So in, in addition to the heat maps, we also show, show the same thing in UMAPs, which nicely show that we have the stem cells and then different uh, populations coming from them. And then uh, we counted also that uh, they were puzzled by the fact that for, first when we did the whole heat map, we had like the transitioning stem cells and uh, 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 undecided stem cells. And then later on, we have these panectodermal stem cells, which were kind of based on different criteria. So they were like, is, are they the same cells? So we were able to calculate them and roughly 90% uh, with 90% overlap. So that was good. And then we also added some functional uh, knockdowns of uh, these individual uh, 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 pluripotency genes. And we could see that whereas in, with um, uh, with nanog morpholino and uh, KLF morpholino, we lose neural crest. Uh, the domain gets smaller here, uh, whereas in, with the pole morpholino, we actually increase uh, the neural crest region. So individually, uh, they might still do uh, uh, different things. But this is something for us to uh, then do uh, to more data uh, later. Okay, I will stop sharing, and uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Laura, for this amazing talk. So I'm going to open uh, the floor for questions. You can use the Q&A to uh, ask your questions. And um, I'm going to read them live in, we can actually, oh, well, that was fast. So I have one question from Pablo Server Matula from Argentina. He says, hi, Lara, beautiful work and presentation. 
I have a technical question related to how different ACR pros might have different hybridization efficiencies to the target gene. Is there any kind of normalization you have to do? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we can, uh, since uh, the probes can bind, like different probe sets have different efficiency. We know that sometimes you have probes that don't bind. So, mm -hmm. so like, even though we have like 20 probes per gene, you we might have only if, for the, the, it might be that only 18 of them bind. And then for the other genes, all 20 bind or other genes, only 12 bind efficiently. So uh, to, so we cannot ever compare the expression pattern to each other. We cannot say based on the HER that PAC7 is expressed more than, than SOX10, but we can compare PAC7 within the different uh, time points. So yeah, but that's a good point. Hi, Pablo. So question. <laughs> So now a question is from Simon Han. It says, hi, Dr. Kurosuo. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. I'm a big fan of your work. What signaling pathways do you think they are involved in maintaining the T2 potency in the ectoderm? And do you think there might be a link between that and why the cranial neural crest can form mesodermal cell types with other neural crests cannot? Yeah, so the... Um... Yes, probably the same. Well, we know that wind, uh, wind is a big inducer of neural quest, and then also the dorsal neural tube expresses PMP four during the the, the times, uh, and then later on, like F FGFs also play a role. FGFs coming from the from the um, uh, somites uh, induce uh, 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 activation or, or provide in inductive signals to the neural tube and the and the dorsal neural tube as well and also retinoic acid is expressed by the somites and also but to, but maybe but that's more like an anterior posterior uh, formation so less of retinoic acid is known to be expressed in the head but specifically what um, maintains the pluripotency we i we are working on that i don't i'm hesitant to say uh, anything but also remember that the the potential so ba now based on the differences in the axial levels based on our work it looks like the the these pluripotency genes are expressed in throughout from head to toe and that is not linked to their ability to make the the mesenchymal like cell types later on but and instead actually it's we for our studies we uh, in the field we mostly use the model organisms so we use like a uh, the, the zebra fish, we use frog, we use uh, mouse, and we use the chicken mostly. So in all of these species, the trunk neural crest doesn't give rise to any mesenchymal cell types. But for example, in the turtle, there the the turtle plastron, which is that the tummy side of the of the shelf, is actually neural crest derived. So that is bone. And and also uh, like in, in axolotl, they they have shown also contribution uh, to uh, to the to the uh, of the uh, uh, that trunk crest was able to give rise to the the cranial bone. So so this is like it. How we interpret this is that perhaps uh, the neural crest actually. Uh, all along has uh, the whole axial level has had originally like uh, evolutionary has the potential to make all these derivatives but then secondary uh, uh, secondary regulation has inhibited from the trunk because it's not needed in the trunk in uh, in many of the vertebrates yeah did that so answer have... i think it was a good answer <laughs> so it's... simon has another question so it's like what do you think that is concerned between all the species that have neural crest or would have or would the different models of neural crest stem potential or would the different models of oh, be species specific i asked because all three proposed models all use different organic models um, use, yeah. use mouse membranes and well the Yes, yes. So, a bunch of so like, yes. So this was also like one of the reviewers was like uh, really like insisting that we need to do the whole shebang also in mouse. And we were like, that's like five years of work. We're not going to do that. But that's why we kind of used the mouse embryo uh, just to show the principle that uh, the, the that there is the co-expression of the pluripotency genes in the entire. So our no, most novel, our biggest finding of this paper is that the uh, pluripotency expression is not uh, 
uh, lost during gastrulation, but it's in, instead maintained in the entire ectoderm at first, and then it gradually declines. So that we showed with the mouse, but of course, like uh, species specific uh, differences are always possible, although the gene regulatory networks are pretty conserved based on uh, based on many, many studies, but uh, mm, it's still worth like def definitely like there is a possibility that there are changes, but at least the main principle seems to be the same in these two. Yeah. So I have a question about um, these samples. Two, two main in the beginning. I, I found really interesting that you show that the different polyprotein genes, they act in different pathways and they don't have much overlapping, but in the end, they act in different genes, but the pathways are always the same. So do you think that's a way of the cells to try to control this pluripotent a little bit more? And if you lack one of them, you or if you have an overexpression of one of them, you cannot have the full process. What's your intake into that? Yes, so I, I think that actually, uh, first of all, I. Um, it's good to call the the potential pluripotency like because uh, even though we have we show that the pluripotency genes are co-expressed just like in the epiblast before gastrulation and we see the expression of many of the other components of the pluripotency network, uh, it's still unlikely that the ectoderm cells would be identical to the uh, epiblast cells. So probably because they, they are already being specified towards ectoderm. So, but I do think that the pluripotency, like based on our results, I, we, I do think that the pluripotency genes are expressed for two reasons. So the first reason is what we show here that they maintain uh, uh, the ability to inhibit differentiation. So they, 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 they don't allow differentiation as long as they are expressed. But I think that at the same time, we will probably find I know some people are working on this and we are trying to do that too. I think they have a dual role so that they actually re already recruit uh, specifiers of the different domains uh, to the same, uh, um, uh, reg uh, what do you call them, enhancers. So to actually switch then uh, to, towards the differentiation. So I, I think they control the, like assist in, in a controlled way, the transition to from pluripotent to, to differentiation. Yeah. But that remains to be shown. Kind of a um, other question. Oh, sorry, no, go okay. ahead. Yeah, kind of a similar question. So these pluripotency markers are expressed in the epiblast, and you showed they're expressed in the late gastrula. What do you think is happening? Do you have any insight into what's happening in between that and sort of these early gastrula stages? Is it possible that some maybe individual markers are turning off and turning back on again, or do you think it's just sort of a, you know, they're expressed at similar levels throughout that entire kind of time period? I. Uh, for what I can say, uh, already based on what we have published here, but we have collected also earlier stages. So the uh, the earlier you go, the higher the expression levels of the pluripotency genes are. So they gradually decline. So uh, and that was kind of the reason why we didn't include the very early stages to because otherwise then because these are all relative uh, relative comparisons. So if you compare like a stage three to the seven somite, it looks like there's nothing even though our point was to show that. And, and also we did show, uh, because the, the, we were kind of concerned in the beginning, because this is just RNA expression, that we the levels decline all the time. So uh, that is it relevant biologically, but we actually were able to show protein expression also in the uh, at the latest end of new relation stage. So nanog is really there. But, uh, uh, but, the, but I do think that the the pluripotency is also probably higher, the higher the levels, the more true the plur pluripotency is. And then it becomes to be like a version uh, when the levels go down, but how actually the levels affect the, uh, in, the like ability to bind to enhancers that I don't know, but it could be like a level dependent regulation. Uh, yeah. So regarding the chromatin, do you think that they remain in a more poised state rather than more um, differentiated? And do you see uh, differences, or you plan to see differences in the chromatin structure between these these cells, uh, these different type of stem cells that you see in your? In your yeah, I I think I think they uh, they remain poised. There there is a work uh, from last year from um, Pedro Roca's lab. Uh, where they looked at uh, endoderm differentiation from epiblast. And there they showed that nano binds to, is it SOC17? 
so that it co-binds to, to the SOC17 enhancer to, to already uh, kind of direct the cells towards endoderm. So um, I, I wouldn't, I think in, on, in the chromatin level, yes, I think that is the case. And, but then, but also I think that in general, the the chrom the chromatin is kept like more open if uh, and but yet also I don't know how early uh, Marcus uh, Simos Costa published a paper recently where they showed that SOX two uh, co binds with OCT four but that also is a little bit like we in our uh, so it could be a sign of like a pluripotency gene with uh, um, uh, like OCT four and SOX two but um, but they are also kind of both. Uh, we see that OCT4 is heavily expressed in the whole neural tube, so it could be a sign of like neural uh, co-binding too. But I, I think we will see in the future that the, the that that the they are like poised for all these different options already when the pluripotency genes are present. But the presence of the pluripotency genes inhibits the cells from actually differentiating. And maybe a last question regarding the the cancer side of your research. So, do you see you do you you did dumb regulation of these pluripotency genes? Have you ever mm -hmm. tried to overexpress them or maintain their expression? And do you know if that also cause could be a cause for the neuroblastoma development or for other neural breast cancers? Yes. So these are very good questions. We're working on them, but I I'm hesitant to say right now. We still have to like check. But for the for the chicken, we have not done the overexpression. But uh, but yes, we are we are working on like comparing the uh, pluripotency signature with, with some neuroblastoma cells to maybe understand what what initiates the neuroblastoma and do the pluripotency genes actually play a role? But that's also ongoing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So we are just on time. So with this, I'm going to close uh, the webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Um, remember that uh, next week we have. Um, a talk of uh, Sophie Common Lab with uh, three different speakers. We're going to talk about the past, the present, and the future of the NLR immune receptor nanobody fusion that confers resistance uh, to plant disease. So I hope that you were able to, to join and see you.